So for the gospel reading, I've chosen a strange kind of a collage as well. What I've done is I've taken basically from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, basically one-liners that keep repeating the same phrase again and again and again, because that's what I want to focus on for the homily. So I'll just mention each time what the reference is and then make the statement. Matthew chapter 11, verse 15. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 13, 9. He who has ears, let him hear. Matthew 13, 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Mark 4, Verse 9, and he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Luke chapter 8, verse 8, and some seed fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called aloud, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Luke chapter 14, verse 35, salt is good. But if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is of no use either for the soil or even for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mark chapter 8, verse 18. Do you have eyes and not see, ears and not hear? And finally, Matthew chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. Words inspired by God. Many of you remember, and in fact, you are part of a study that I carried out in 1992-93. I was looking at the effects of prayer at a distance on self-esteem, anxiety, and depression. And in, by 1993, it was the largest study of its kind ever carried out anywhere. It was a randomized, controlled, double-blind experiment looking at what happens when people send out an intentionality of prayer for other people, even people whom they didn't know, just using photographs of their targets and watch what happened to those people's self-esteem, anxiety, and depression levels. And uh, when that um, study was finally published, I was invited to take part in an international research group called DMILS, D-M-I-L-S, which means Distant Mental Influences on Living Systems. And it was a group of scientists from all over the world who were looking at the power of intentionality, or what is sometimes called, you know, pejoratively paranormal research, looking at the psi abilities of which prayer would be one. And I was invited to address, to take part in a few conferences, one of them at the Institute of Noetic Sciences with um, Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut, once in Harvard University and once in Duke University. And I remember uh, when I was presenting in Duke, making the comment to people that it, it felt to me like the researchers were operating under a kind of an inferiority complex as a group, that there was this kind of notion somehow that we have to make ourselves respectable to the scientific community. We have to go the extra mile. And so we had to have more stringent design systems in our research and more strig string stringent statistical analysis to try to prove to them we're really real. And this really annoyed me at some stage. And I made the comment that we know that it works. There's been enough research to demonstrate that it actually does work. So why are we you know, adopting this kind of groveling mentality? Please give us respectability. Please recognize that we're, we're doing real scientific work. And what I suggested was, we know that it works. Our research now should be trying to figure out how does it work and how can we learn how to utilize it for the benefit of healing people and healing the world. And I must say that today, at age 73, I have little time or little patience anymore 
for those people who, as they create their models of reality, are not willing to use all of their faculties in the acquisition of data to make their personal cosmologies or create their models of reality. Trying to create a model of reality without including all the data doesn't make any sense to me. We don't, have just, we don't just have intellects. We have imagination. We watch our children at play. We walk in nature and we see what nature does. We dream at night, that gives us information. We have visions sometimes during the day. We meditate and we pray. And we're garnering data from all these uh, efforts. And in order to create adequate reality models and personal cosmologies, we have to be open to using the data from all those mechanisms before we actually create our models. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to make three main points. First one I will talk call, listen up, says Jesus. Secondly, I will look at two forms of fundamentalism. And then thirdly, I'm going to create a whole bunch of stories and parables and metaphors, and I invite you to dig into their deeper meanings. So that's what I'm going to do today. In Matthew's Gospel in chapter 13, Jesus is interrogated twice by his listeners. They want to know why he's always talking in stories and parables. Why doesn't he talk plainly to them? You know, talk philosophy to us, talk science to us, talk reason to us. And he gives two different answers. The first time he says, I speak in parables so that I may reveal things which have been hidden since the foundation of the world. In other words, Christ is saying that there are some truths which are so deep that the only way to access them is through some kind of metaphorical form, through poetry or dance or music or stories or parables or proverbs. That's the only way you can get at them, Christ is suggesting. Later in the chapter, he's interrogated again. Why are you still talking in parables? We, 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 we checked you about this. And the second time he says, I speak in parables so that seeing you may see, but not understand. Hearing you may hear, but not comprehend. Now, what is he talking about? Why would he speak in such a way that they can see, but not understand, and hear, and not comprehend? What does he mean by this? So is he suggesting, for instance, that, you know, you need a cochlear implant or you need cataract surgery so you can hear differently and see differently. He's not talking about a physiological process. He's talking about a totally different way of listening and a totally different way of looking, without which you do not have access to the deeper levels of reality. And if you're not prepared to do it, nothing's going to happen for you. We have a special tense in Swahili which we call the causative uh, tense. So for instance, uh, if I say in Swahili, kusikia, uh, it means to hear. But if I say kusikiliza, it means to listen. In fact, literally kusikiliza means to cause yourself to hear. It's a causative tense. So it's one thing to, 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 to hear and then not pay attention. It's another thing to cause yourself to hear in order to listen, to make this shift from just noise in the background to really focusing on the depth of the message in it. So for instance, in Swahili, uh, uh, the verb to, to see is kuona. To look is kuangalia. But there's another form of, of kuona. It's the causative form. Kuona is to see, and kuonyesha is to show or to demonstrate or to cause somebody to be able to see. And there's a reflexive version of that verb. If I say in Swahili, kuji onyesha, it means to show something to myself, to demonstrate something to myself, to cause myself to see, to really dig deeply into what's really, really happening. Now, the problem is there's a huge difference between background noise and the real meaning of a message. If I look out right here at the moment, you know, and you say to me, what do you see outside the window? I see three deer right now, but that's not all I see. I see mountains, I see trees, I see redwoods, I see the hills, I see the sky, I see my deck, but I'm ignoring all those things because I've chosen to focus on the three deer. And that's what happens so often. We don't know how to look anymore. And we don't know how to hear or to listen anymore. And this is the frustration of Jesus Christ this morning, again and again and again. Those who have ears to hear, 
let them hear. Those who have eyes to see, let them see. And I speak in parables so that seeing you may see, but not understand. And hearing you may hear, but not comprehend. Because if you're not really listening at a deeper level than your ears, or looking with a deeper level than your eyes, you're not going to get the message of Jesus, and you're not going to get the message of reality. And whatever you construct as being reality, or your personal cosmology, is going to be pitifully poor. You have to learn to use all of these other methods. Now the problem is, when we do listen and we do look, then all of our sensory data has to be run through pre-existing personal cosmologies and pre-existing models of reality. And these are, it's largely done totally at an unconscious level. And there's a huge bias built in, a bias in favor of previous belief systems. I talked about that last week with the notion of the Samuel White's reflex, where there's almost a, an automatic reflex to reject new knowledge or new ways of looking at stuff because somehow they contradict old belief systems. And that's Jesus' frustration with his audience. And that's why there are so many people stuck in our world today, because so many people don't know how to look and they don't know how to hear. They're totally fixated on just one modality and they're not prepared to step outside that modality. And then we figure out, you know, why we're not happy campers, you know, why we're not aligned and why we're unhappy. So that's my first point. Listen up, as Jesus says. I secondly, want to look at the um, notion of fundamentalism. And we typically think that fundamentalism has to do with just Christian groups, you know, who are literalist thinkers. Fundamentalism is a much greater reality and phenomenon than that. And so there are four stages to the fundamentalist uh, process. Wherever you find fundamentalism, whether it's in the news media or in scientism or in religious fundamentalism, there's always four stages to fund fundamentalism. The first stage is you have to take a really complex phenomenon and reduce it down to some simplistic bumper sticker one-liners. That's the first stage of the fundamentalist project. The second stage is then you have to either identify or create an enemy figure. The third stage is you have to dehumanize the enemy or vilify the enemy. And then fourthly, you're now justified in attacking the enemy. So firstly, the reduction of a complex phenomenon to simplistic one-liners. Secondly, the identification of or the creation of an enemy. Thirdly, the dehumanization or the vilification of the enemy. And then fourthly, the attack on the enemy. And in my experience, although I, I encounter fundamentalist thinking in a whole spectrum of areas, the two worst forms for me are dogmatic religion and dogmatic scientism which is not really science, it's scientism. So let me just look at scientism for a few moments. What is scientism? Yeah, so how does it go through the four stages? What's the reduction involved in scientism? The reduction is that you take reality uh, and you boil it down to that which can be measured. So something is not real unless you can measure it in your laboratory. So that's the taking a really complex phenomenon like the cosmos and reducing it down to our instrumentation. So if it can't be measured, it ain't real. That's the reduction part of it. Who are the enemies that are created by scientism? They're alternative thinkers, people who think outside the box. And what's the ridicule and the vilification that they engage in? Simply calling these other thinkers quacks or pseudoscientists and the employee of two philosophical you know, issues, they reduct you ad absurdum and argumentum ad hominem, to try to vilify the people and the arguments. And then what is the attack of scientism? It is to refuse a platform to people who think differently. And so for instance, very, very often, the kind of research in which I was involved, it won't be accepted in peer reviewed uh, magazines. So you can't get your research in there, even though the protocols of the research and the statistical analysis are top class. They won't publish the results. So now you've got to publish it elsewhere. And then they say, see, if this were real science, it would be in a peer-reviewed magazine. But it's not. So that says it's not real science. They de-platform people by the media scoffing at stuff. The pseudoscience of homeopathy or the quackery you know, of naturopathy. Very, very often scientists who are interested in thinking outside the box, they can't get grants for their research. 
But if you want to develop an atomic bomb, there's as much you know, grants available as you can, can't even handle. And very often these scientists, they can't get tenure in universities or they're thrown out of their positions because they're thinking outside the box. That's the third stage. And the fourth stage is, what does the, the attack look like then? The attack, you know, is that the old guys have to die off and the old thinking has to die off before there's new possibilities. The father of quantum mechanics, Max Planck, one of the greatest geniuses of the 20th century, said famously at one stage, science evolves one funeral at a time. It's only when the old people with the old thinking actually die off that there's an opportunity for new kinds of ideas. So that's what, you know, fundamentalist science or scientism begins to look like. What about science, you know, fundamentalist religion? What are the four stages of fundamentalist religion? The reduction phase. You take the extraordinary mysticism of the encounter with the ineffable God and you reduce it down to dogmatic theological assertions. That's the reduction piece. The second piece, you create an enemy. Who's the enemy? The enemy is the unorthodox believer or the prophetic visionary person. That's the enemy. And what's the vilification? The vilification is they're going to call them heretics or blasphemers or witches. And then what is the attack? The attack goes from all the way from excommunication to inquisitions to crusades. When you look throughout human history, the truly great teachers, whether we're talking about you know, spiritual teachers or scientific teachers, are the, ability, are the people who have the ability to think outside the box. There's no great scientific advance that's ever been created by orthodox thinkers locked into old systems, afraid to do any kind of new research. And the same thing is true in religion. It is, it is those who think outside the box and are open to data which are generated from all of the faculties of what it means to be human. They're the people who are advancing human civilization. But it's a lot easier to be safe and smug in religious dogmatism or in scientific fundamentalism. That's my second point. And for my third point, over the last week, I just decided to create a whole bunch of stories and parables and metaphors and to see if you can unpack it yourself, you know, if for its deeper meanings. So I just put a whole bunch of them together, totally different stuff out of my imagination to try to demonstrate what I've been talking about. But I'm going to allow you to unpack each one of these metaphors or each one of these stories. The first one is the skyscraper. And this was a vision I had many, many years ago. I was working, which I continually am, on looking at my own personal model of reality and how can I expand it and change it and grow it. And I had this vision of um, a cylindrical circular skyscraper of many, many stories. So it's built in a circular form in a cylindrical fashion. And to get into the skyscraper, you have to go in underground, an underground passage. And the elevator bank runs up through the middle of this building. So as you go up on the elevator, as you step out onto any floor, you find yourself in a circular corridor. And opening off this, this corridor, in my vision, were eight different rooms. So as I entered each room, each room is wedge-shaped. So the inner wall is a piece of a curve, and then the side walls go out, and then the back wall is a bigger curve. And I entered into these rooms. And the first room, I'm going to call it room 101. It's the first room on the ground floor. And I go into this, and it appears to me that there's a mural, you know, painted on the wall, on the back wall. And it's painted in just stick figures. It's very, very primitive. But it's interesting. I think, wow, interesting mural. And I look at it, and I think I've understood what the mural is. Then I come out of the room, and I go into a room 102, the room next door. And there's a mural on the back wall of that one. And I suddenly realize that, wow. This is actually is part of the mural that I saw in room 101. So if I'd only stayed in room 101, I wouldn't have seen the full mural. And one by one, I got to all eight rooms on the, on the first floor. And I realized that every room has a portion of the mural. And if I hadn't circumnavigated all eight rooms, I wouldn't have seen the entire mural. I needed to go into every single room in order to see a new piece of the puzzle. But they're all stick figures. So I figured out, I wonder what would happen if I went to the second floor. 
So I go back into the elevator, go up onto the second floor, I come out, and there's room 201. And I go into room 201, and I find it's the same mural. But this time, it's not just stick figures. It's realistic drawings in black and white. So it's much, much more alive. And again, as I go from room to room to room, I see that I'm seeing, finally, the entire mural. But I'm seeing it, you know, in a much more vibrant rendition in black and white. So I figure, okay, I wonder what it looks like on the third floor. So I go up to the third floor, I go into room 301, and I see it's the same mural, but this time it's in vibrant color. And I go to 301, 302, 303, around to 308, and it's the entire mural in this vibrant, vibrant color. So I figure, okay, can I risk going to the next floor? I go to the next floor and I find the same mural, but it's in 3D. It's a three-dimensional thing. It seems to be actually coming out of the wall. So it's a three-dimensional reality. And I go from 301 to 308 and I encounter the entire mural in three-dimensional full color. And then I go to room four, uh, to floor four. And now I got the same mural, but this time, not only is it three-dimensional, it is interactive. I'm not just observing something. I'm actually participating and engaging with as it's engaging with me. And at the end of the vision, I figure out that the different rooms on any floor represent different states of consciousness, like the waking state, the dreaming state, meditation state, nature stage, watching children. They're all just states of consciousness. But in order to evolve, because anybody can have these experiences, how do you grow? How do you evolve? You've got to get onto the elevator, go to the second floor and the third floor and the fourth floor, etc. So while the rooms on any one uh, floor are states of consciousness, going up the elevator brings you into different stages of consciousness. In order to grow, you need to not just go from room to room on one floor, you need to get onto the elevator and experiment with the others. Now, fundamentalists are people who create their models of reality from visiting one room on the first floor. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Here's a second silly metaphor, parable. Tom and Jerry are framers, house builders. But Tom believes that the only thing you need to build a house is a hammer. Jerry believes that you need a whole bunch more tools. So he has a saw, he's got power tools, he's got a plumb line, he's got a spirit level. So Tom builds a house which just basically looks like a box with a roof on it. And the first time it rains, it leaks. And the first time there's a decent gust of wind, it blows the roof off. And because he lives in California, with a 5.0 uh, earthquake, the whole house collapses. Jerry has built a house which is a thing of beauty. It survives the rain, it survives the wind, and it survives the earthquake. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Here's the third parable. Imagine that I was asked by a group of Americans uh, to lead a bike tour of Ireland because I'm Irish, I know Ireland. So they want me to uh, be the guide and the leader of a bicycle trip in Ireland. And we slip our bikes over to Ireland and we start our journey. Now, if I'm to provide leadership for the group, I need to be ahead of the group to show them where we're going, but not too far ahead. Because if I'm too far ahead and they get to a crossroads and they can't see me, they don't know did I go straight ahead, did I go to the left, or did I go to the right? So I'm a very, a very poor leader if I'm too far ahead of the pack. But if I'm sitting in the middle of the pack, and when the first riders get to any crossroads, they gotta stop and wait for me to catch up and say, are we going left or right or straight ahead? I would still be a really poor leader. So the leader of the bike tour has to be somebody who's far enough ahead of the group to provide leadership, but not too far ahead that they're out of sight. Now, I'm on this bike trip to Ireland, and at some stage, I get a message, somebody shouted me, stop, 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 stop. And I cycle back, and they say, Billy is away back at the last crossroads. And Billy thinks you made a mistake, you took a wrong turn. So now I have to go to cycle back, and I gotta persuade Billy, I know what I'm doing. And he should be, you know, coming where the group is. And so reluctantly, he agrees. 10 miles down the road, I get another message, come back, come back, come back. Billy is very unhappy with you. 
And I go back, cycle back to Billy, and Billy says, I am convinced now that at the last crossroads, you took a wrong turn. And I have to argue with Billy again. I didn't take a wrong turn. I know where I'm going. And for the next 50 miles, every so often, I get a message from Billy that I need to come back and talk to him because he's convinced I'm, in, I'm on the wrong road. So at some stage of the journey, I'm going to have to let Billy get lost and do what Billy needs to do. I can't keep stopping the tour every time Billy decides they're taking a wrong mistake. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Here's another silly metaphor. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie City of Angels, starring Meg Ryan and uh, Nicolas Cage. And Nicolas Cage is an angel who really, really wanted to have a human incarnational experience. So he takes on a human spacesuit. But he's a total neophyte. He has no idea what's happening around him. And he meets Meg Ryan, and she doesn't know that he's an angel. And at one stage, they go grocery shopping, and she comes back with a big bag of groceries, and she takes an orange out, and she cuts the orange, and she is biting into it. And Nick, the angel, Nicholas Cage, says to her, what does an orange taste like? And she's shocked. She says, you don't know what an orange tastes like? And then he recovers really quickly. He says, well, I, I, I don't know what it tastes like to you. Now, I had this image last night as I was thinking about this homily. Imagine I'm eating an orange, and Timmy comes in, and Timmy has never seen an orange in his life. He's seen lemons, but he's never seen an orange. He doesn't know such a thing as oranges exist. And he sees me biting into the orange. He says, what are you doing biting into a lemon? I say, this is not a lemon. This is an orange. He says, no, no. There's no such thing as an orange. It's a lemon. I can see it. I know what a lemon looks like. You're biting into a lemon. And I say, it's not a lemon. It's an orange. It's totally different. Here, have a bite. He says, no, no, no. There's no way I'm going to bite into a lemon. It's a lemon. I'm not even going to try it. Now, if you're not prepared to taste the orange, you don't get the right to vote as to whether it's an orange or a lemon. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Here's another silly metaphor. Danny is a friend of mine who only believes that there's one sense, that human beings only have one sense. It's the olfactory sense, what the information that our nose delivers to us. So I bring him out where I live, on the top of a mountain, and I say, look at that glorious sunset. And he says to me, I don't believe sunsets exist because I can't smell it. So I say, okay. So I bring him inside, and I got this beautiful piece of music, a piece I picked out actually for the final blessing today. You'll hear it for the final blessing. And I play this for him, and I say, what do you think? He says, I don't believe music exists because I can't smell it. I say, okay. So I go to my fridge, and I bring out... Um, a tub of uh, rum raisin ice cream. I love rum raisin ice cream. And I take a scoop and I give it to him. And I say, what do you think of that? What does that taste like? And he says, I don't believe in ice cream because I can't smell it. And then finally I say, oh, okay, buddy. And I give him a big, big hug. I say, can you feel that? He says, I don't believe the hugs exist because I can't smell it. So unless everything can be reduced to the olfactory sense, it doesn't exist for Danny. Those who have ears to hear, let them listen. One final crazy metaphor. Sammy lives in Southern California. And at one stage he decides he, want to he wants to explore the entire state of California, which is over 600 miles long. And so he rents a car in San Diego. And he drives his car all the ways along Highway 101, all the way north to Eureka, at the very northern tip of California. But he never gets off the highway, never gets off 101. And he never even gets out of the car. He's never trekked a trail. He's never swum in a lake. He's never kayaked in a river. He's never climbed a mountain. He's never walked in the redwood forest. And yet he's convinced that he just explored California. Those who have ears to hear, let them listen. God has given us a whole range of faculties. We have our imagination, which I keep defining. It is not fantasy. Fantasy is making up stuff that's not real. Imagination is the ability to volitionally stay, change your state of consciousness, enter into different dimensions, interact with different energies and entities that reside in those different dimensions, learn from them, 
and bring that information back to this waking state of consciousness and cross fertilize it with data generated through other modalities. God has given you imagination. God has given us children to watch at their play and to learn from what they're doing, not just to pity them as mere kids, but to learn from their ability. God has given us nature and elementals of all kinds that speak to us, trees that speak to us, spiders' webs that speak to us, sunsets that speak to us, waterfalls that speak to us. God has given us the ability to dream at night and to generate data in our dream life. God has given us the ability to have visionary experiences during the day. God has given us the ability to meditate and to pray. These are all the faculties given to us by God. If we're not using all of these faculties, we're not generating the data we need to create our models of reality and our personal cosmologies. If you're not engaging all of your God-given faculties, you won't even achieve lift-off velocity, let alone visit among the stars. Namaste. I'm going to go to Johanna. It's just a really quick question. So on your retreat, you're doing a, like a, a different ty type of a tour of Ireland, right? Of Irish mythology and, and Celtic spirituality and that'll be right. there, right? So the retreat begins on May the 11th, 11th, 12th and 13th. There'll be two lectures every day, uh, one and a half hours per session, an hour for lecture and a half hour for discussion. And I'm really grateful to Karen Rubin for orchestrating this. So the topic of the retreat is um, spirituality beyond gender, Celtic wisdom, and um, the Ascension Project. So that's what I'll be covering in over the course of six lectures. Move on to the line of John Animal. Okay. <laughs> Quick question about the, the study in terms of, I just, just to review back, was there a difference in terms of improvements in self-esteem in, in terms of the people doing the praying versus the recipients? Can yes. you speak a moment on that? Yes, that's a great question, Johnny. And for me, that was the single most interesting result of the whole study. And so I had, there were 509 people involved in the study, 90 of whom I'm going to call the agents who were doing the praying. And each of the agents received uh, an, a, uh, an A4 sheet of nine photographs of people for whom they were to pray. Mm -hmm. And so um, while everybody was tested on uh, self-esteem, anxiety, and depression before the study began on the 15th of August in 1992. And the study ended officially on the 8th of December in 1992. And then I analyzed the results over the succeeding months. But one of the astounding things was that both the agents who were doing the praying and the subjects who were being prayed for, yeah, all of them were all of them were tested. The most astounding result of all for me was that by far the most significant improvement was in the people who were doing the praying. Now, some of these results were at a p-value of 10 to the power of minus six, which means that there was only one chance in one million that these results could have happened by chance. And so uh, there was improvement all around. But the greatest improvement was the people who altruistically uh, devoted time every day to praying for other people. And that for me has become a cornerstone of my therapeutic style. When somebody comes to therapy for me and they're complaining about a situation in which they're involved and I can sympathize with that, I say, the chief way you can overcome this is to extend yourself for other people. Who do you know of who's in worse straits than yourself? Spend time with them, volunteer to do something. Get out beyond your own ego. And by going beyond the ego, what you find out is that your soul is actually healing. So that was the single most important, uh, interesting result to me, Johnny. Go ahead, Karen. So I, I'm going to ask for a repeat of part of what you talked about in the homily, the particular parable having to do with the carpenters. I'm just building on a statement by uh, the great uh, American you know, uh, psychologist, Abraham Maslow. Mm, when he okay. said famously one time, if all you have is a hammer, everything begins to look like a nail. And so if you only have one mindset, one way of looking at life, you know, you're going to force everything to conform to that. So that's another version of the Samuel Weiss reflex, that the inability to accept new data or even new modalities of, of, of kind of research because you're fixated on a particular methodology and you're threatened by anything which doesn't conform to that. 
And so if it can't be expressed in your particular modality, then it's not real. If I can't build a house with a hammer, you know, then it's not a real house. And he, he tries to build a house with a hammer and the result is it leaks, the roof falls off and it collapses in an earthquake. When the chips are down and you really need to do, dig really, really, really deeply and be able to find serenity and equanimity and evolution, no matter what's happening around you, you need a lot more than a hammer. Right, so that's the plumb line. It can be the plumb line, the power tools, the uh, spirit level. It's all of the other things you need. And these okay. are just metaphors for imagination, um, visions, uh, meditation, prayer, nature. These are all the other power tools. If you want to be a real framer. Okay, okay. So not thinking the plumb line necessarily is that grounding to center. It, it's just one of the, one of the, one tools. Of the tools. One okay. of the tools. Yeah. Thank you. Bill and Sharon. Uh, yes, Sean, um, at the beginning of your uh, parables, I, I came up with the idea or the, is this pandemic accelerating the die off of the old thinkers? However, many times it's the older generation that is it revising its belief system. Mm -hmm. And if the younger generation has bought into the current belief systems, the problem is how can humanity Assure that the old systems, old systems die out if the younger, the young continue to accept and support the old reality. And my feeling is that it's not the children, but it's the grandchildren that will be making the difference. That's brilliant. That's a, that's a brilliant observation, Bill. And so there's so many different factors involved in this, and you're absolutely spot on. Because there's this extraordinary, you know, uh, intermingling, cross-fertilization between the, the young and the elderly. It's the yin and the yang. The elderly uh, bring wisdom and life experience to the debate. And the youth bring enthusiasm, you know, and the ability to think outside the box. So it's a great combination. But sometimes it has to skip a generation or even several generations but evolution will never cease. Evolution will continue to, to develop. Now, the only question is, will the human race be part of that f future evolutionary trajectory or will we destroy ourselves so that nature has to throw up a different species to carry on this quest for the evolutionary trajectory? An evolutionary trajectory which, whose teleological destiny or destination is to realize its own divinity and the divinity of all other life forms. And humanity has been on the edge of that for several generations now, but we haven't quite made the shift. So there's this real tug of war between the old entrenched systems, you know, and the new possibilities. So the question is, you know, is it gonna skip a generation or two? And if it needs to, and it does, and a future generation gets where we were unable to get, c'est la vie. Uh, but since I believe in reincarnation, I'm not particularly worried about it because I know that I volunteer to come back again and I'll find myself 500 years time uh, in a new kind of humanity, which I've helped to lay the groundwork for, as you've helped to lay the groundwork for, as every one of us here present has helped to lay the groundwork for. So whether we harvest it in this incarnation or we harvest it in a future incarnation is not particularly of value to me. St. Paul said famously one time, one man sows, another man reaps. So I, it's not necessarily the generation that does the heavy lifting that actually gets the reward. But if you believe that time is just an artifact, an overlay of a particular template on the raw data of reality, then you can transcend time. In fact, you need to transcend time. I'm totally convinced that by altering a state of consciousness, you go trans-temporal, you step outside of time. You go trans-spatial, you step outside of just the physical reality. You go transpersonal. you're not just thinking as an individual, you're th thinking as a cell in the body of Christ. So you're going trans-dimensional, you're having uh, encounters with other entities. In the woods out here, I encounter elementals of various kinds, spirits of the little creek, spirits of the spider's web, spirits of the tree leaves on a regular basis. And that's where I write my poetry. And that's where I get a lot of my ideas from listening to them. And so yeah, we have to go trans-dimensional. 
We have to go transpersonal. We have to go transtemporal. We have to go transspatial. You know, and as kids do that naturally, we can pick that up from them. And so whatever generation reaps the harvest, I'm not particularly worried as long as there's a harvest to be reaped. Susie. Something you said about the, the one-liner bumper sticker. Right. Um, the, what I thought right away was that, um, and, and this I think has happened to me, like if you're tuned in, you can see one of these one-liner bumper stickers and it can go in the opposite direction. It can yes. and sort of open up your imagination to um, explore the, the concept or explore whatever it is that it has brought you to. Right. That's beautiful. You're absolutely right. And I say this very often that, you know, while stories are the archived wisdom of a culture, proverbs are the distillation of those archives. And proverbs are basically just one-liners. Mm -hmm. And so when you realize that these one-liners can lead you into the archives, that's brilliant. If you think the one-liner is the beginning and the end of the wisdom, then you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And so as a bumper sticker, if a bumper sticker becomes an invitation to go transrational and transdimensional and transspecial, you're in, you've, you've accessed the Akashic Records. You're like a kid in a candy store. If you think that the bumper sticker is the beginning and the end of all wisdom, then you're not going to grow. So there's this uh, real realization. Is this a bait to get me you know, into the real food? Or do I believe that this is the entire meal? Tom and Mary? I fully agree with every thing I've heard you say, at least as far as I can hear it. But I, I have a, a question to ask you, because let's, let's just take science. There are a lot of people out there who are doing really bad science. You know, they don't use their statistics right, they don't set up their experiments well, and they come up with bad conclusions. Now, how do you tell when you are being narrow-minded and not being willing to hear the new ways of looking at things and yet still be able to judge what within the old paradigm is just plain bad science and statistics and the same is true of religion and all of the people who are who look at Christianity and rather than going where Christianity is pointing them to go somehow you know, hate their enemies, you know, I mean, okay, I, I, I think you probably have my I, question. Yeah, I get your question, Tom, it's a great question. So can you see my hand? Yes. Can you see the five fingers? Yes. I want to mention what each finger represents here. This first finger represents innocence. Innocent people are those who believe anything they're told. The second finger is naivete. A naive person will believe most of what they're told, but they'll sometimes ask questions. The third finger is critical thinking. People who are open to all the evidence and will examine all the data and examine all the methodologies employed, including statistics and research design. Number four is the skeptic. And the skeptic is somebody who's not open to all the data. He's only selectively open to some of the data and he'll totally disregard a whole bunch of it. And the final position is the debunker. This is somebody who's not open to any data whatsoever that's not in full alignment with his previously entrenched belief systems. These are the kind of people who make this statement, and one of them actually has, who said, speaking about some psi research, he said, this is the kind of thing that even if it were true, I wouldn't believe it. Right. Uh, so we have to figure out where do we land? That's the place to land. Not in innocence, not in naivete, not in the debunker, not in the skeptic, but in the critical thinker. Somebody who's totally open to all the data and all the research methodologies that are emerging, and he's prepared to, to go where the evidence leads, but not somebody who's made up their mind or somebody who's totally gullible. So as to find that position, and it's important as you look at science and as you look at religion, that you're operating from that middle position. And it's unfortunate that it's a middle finger. <laughs> I call upon Kitty. As you know, Sean, I'm working with people who 
uh, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of need. How do we get people who are considering themselves the lowliest people that quote, unquote, uh, nobody cares in this pandemic whether I live or die or whether my children live or die. How do we encourage people in those kinds of situations to look at the metaphysical side of this existence? Okay, that's a great question, Catherine. And so, uh, like any, you know, any topic, you can only kind of say so much about a topic. It's like you have a huge big jigsaw puzzle and you take a one piece for a lecture or a homily and you explain this piece. But this piece belongs in a much bigger picture. And so you have to look at some of the other pieces. So hopefully over the course of a year or whatever, you can examine a whole bunch of the pieces and then put them back in where they belong. And so everything I've said is a piece of the puzzle that comes out of a context. And the bigger context for me is that we are eternal beings who volunteered for incarnation. And we try out a whole bunch of different space suits from incarnation to incarnation in order to totally plumb the experience of being a human person in a space suit. And in different incarnations, we're going to find we're going to change genders. We're going to change socioeconomic status. We're going to change even IQ level all the way from being geniuses to being, you know, mentally handicapped. We're going to choose different uh, ethnicities. We're going to cho choose affiliation to different denominational religious belief systems. We're going to try all of these things to find out in, in this particular configuration, could I still learn how to love? And so we, here's a particular just configuration uh, right now. There are 7.5 billion of us on planet Earth right now. Every one of us is an ancient soul who volunteer to be on the planet at this stage and to inhabit different kinds of spacesuits, different genders, different socioeconomic statuses, you know, different ethnicities, whatever. And the objective is that those who have more resources are available to those who have less resources. But what tends to happen is that those who have the, the most resources become an oligarchy who want to control the resources and grab them from everybody else. So their mission was to exercise compassion for everybody. And instead of that, they've exercised control. So they're totally misaligned. The other people who are in very, very dire straits and are finding it difficult to put a meal on the table, they're in a situation where they volunteer to be the recipients of the love of others. And they try to develop resilience or courage or patience or whatever they're being called upon to develop right now but they're looking for leadership to people who are more resourced and very often they're not finding it from there. They're not getting it from the oligarchs who are billionaires. They're not getting it from the church leaders who are dogmatic theologians. They're not getting it from anybody and they're left to their own devices. So the whole jigsaw puzzle has been scrambled. And uh, those of us who are trying to come awake must try to create a brand new configuration of the pieces in which everybody can access their deepest soul in every subsequent incarnation because the groundwork will have been done, the foundation will have been laid and the house will be built with all of the tools which are available to us. And I'm glad there are people all over the world, there are little communities like us everywhere. All you gotta do is a very quick internet search. There are people who are trying to do it through music, through drama, through poetry, you know, through um, dancing in the streets, whatever it is they're trying to do to raise human spirit, to kind of deliver food, to the homeless or, or, or the homebound. So the, the, the explosion of, of compassion, which is coming not from the oligarchs at the top, who are continuing to kind of cream this and harvest it for more control and more power, but from those in the middle very, very often, not completely resourced, but having some resources, they're the ones who are going to make the breakthrough. They're the grandparents and the grandchildren, perhaps, who are going to birth the new reality. Go to Patricia Burrow. This is actually Joe's question. I kind of feel I've been maybe through some of my questions and possibly through some emails that I had sent to Sean, uh, misunderstood, uh, hopefully not vilified uh, as, as a seeker, and possibly, hopefully not the Billy that's holding up the, the Ireland bike ride uh, for a fully love and respect uh, the community and Sean and welcome the challenges. Um, I love art, nature, children, inspiration, imagination. Um, 
and all the things and the wisdom traditions of the world that I am a seeker in the, in the sense that I am trying to be open-minded. Um, I personally do have some difficulties when I feel that people need to rely on science to justify spirituality. And they try to fit everything to that. And by uh, Sean's own admission, science really carries a very rigorous and uh, it's very limited in its scope. And I feel that, you know, we don't need science to prove what we deeply believe and know through so many other uh, sources. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, I just wanted to clarify my position to Sean and to the community and uh, that I am still showing up and I'm looking and listening and uh, I hope to be a, cr a critical thinker and not to be a skeptic, although sometimes skepticism enters in. Um, but I just wanted to make clear and clarify, clarify myself, especially to you, Sean, uh, with whom I've shared more personal emails. And I don't want to be uh, written off as some sort of uh, debunker, skeptic, or critical of everything. So just a moment of clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So just to respond to the two questions, the two pieces you've raised. The first one is that uh, when I decide to, uh, to uh, work on a homily, you know, I'm working on the basis of questions I'm getting from lots of different people. And very, very often, you know, I then begin to kind of formulate my own thinking around the questions that have been asked. So it's not that I'm trying to uh, debunk or vilify anybody. It's saying, okay, here were real questions being raised. How do I treat that in my personal cosmology? And today's homily, for instance, is treating the whole no notion of scientism. Now, why I, I depend on science because I'm a trained scientist. But I realize that science is not confined to the laboratory or to mathematics. The word science comes from the Latin word scientia, which literally means knowledge. So any seeker after knowledge is a scientist. A scientist doesn't have to have a PhD in physics to be a recognized scientist. Anybody who's a seeker of knowledge and is prepared to think critically, but much more importantly, is prepared to do the searching through all of the modalities and all of the faculties available to us. That for me is the real scientist. And at this stage of my life, that's my pursuit. And so at this stage, I want to focus completely on using all of the faculties and encouraging people to use all their faculties. And if they do, they're going to be dealing with data, which the scientific model, you know, in the kind of mainstream scientific model is either going to vilify or totally ignore. And that's the reason why we've, uh, we have nuclear bombs, you know, and the uh, desecration of the wildlife because we've, we've depended upon the scientific method to find solutions to our problems. Science can offer some solutions to our problems, but at a huge cost. If there's not a conscience, a conscience, the word conscience in Latin means conscientia, that which goes along with science, that which goes along with knowledge. There's a responsibility that goes along with knowledge. And very, very often, the mainstream scientific groups are not prepared to look at the consequences of their discoveries or their theories. And I have a big issue with that because it's given us the world we're residing in right now. Call on Trish, please unmute. As I'm, I'm listening and I'm staring out at nature much like you do where you are, um, I, I, it just brings up one question, and that is, you know, I'm thinking about Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. Right. So is there really such a thing as a beginning and end to wisdom? Right. Is there really such a thing as a new belief or new wisdom? Because in my mind, I'm wondering if it's just always been, but it may be new to us, but it's always been there. It's a great question, Trish. And so it's interesting that, uh, my take on Ecclesiastes has always been this, when it says stuff like there's a time to tear down and a time to build, a time for war and a time for peace. I don't believe that the writer of that text is saying, you know, it's appropriate to go to war at some stages. I don't believe he's saying that. What he's saying, in my opinion, is, is in the human incarnation, there will be a time in your life when you're going to experience war. There's a time in your life when you're going to experience destruction. There's a time in your life when you're going to experience plants growing up. So if you live a few human incarnation, you're going to experience all these things. He's not advocating for any one of them. 
He's not advocating for war, but he's saying, if you're incarnated, you're gonna have this kind of experience. So that's the first response to it. The second response is this, that I really, really believe in the concept of parallel universes. There was a, an American physicist called Hugh Everett III who came up with that theory, you know, sometime in the 1950s, I believe, and he was laughed out of court by the scientific world. In fact, he gave up science completely and became a very embittered old man. Uh, I, now it's being accepted as a real reality. I believe totally that all possibilities are present, that every time nature is faced with a choice between A and B, it chooses both. And having chosen A, when it now meets the bifurcation point between C and D, it chooses both. And so if there are an infinite number of universes out there, it means that every possible configuration of all the choices made by all beings throughout all of time are out there somewhere in the universe of their own. Now the question becomes, through my intentionality and my attention, I can choose to select out that particular universe in which a particular configuration happens. So it's not so much even that we're creating a brand new universe by the choices we make, it's that they're already existent because time does not exist. So all of those universes are already out there. What, what brings them into focus is the quantum mechanical realization that it's the observer that collapses the wave function down to the particle. It's observation that selects out that which we now become aware of. So all of these possible universes exist. Universes in which we're making war nonstop. Universes in which we're totally in sync with nature. They all already exist. The question then becomes, when I let my mind run, my thoughts and my words and my actions, what version am I selecting out personally? And when, as a world community, that we create this, what I'm going to call a global tulpa. Uh, Hinduism and Buddhism talk about the tulpa. A tulpa is a thought form that takes on an independence of the thinker. So you've had thoughts in the past, and these thoughts interact with you, and they change your mindset and your mood set. So they're independent of you. Now, when a whole bunch of us come to the same thought, and we'll do that through propaganda, or through fake news, that we all arrive in the same place with the same kinds of thoughts, we're actually creating a global tulpa. And mostly it's a global tulpa of fear and anxiety and xenophobia. And then we wonder why we have the world we have. We've selected it out by that to which we've given our attention. And this is, what, this is the frustration of Jesus. I can see him tearing his hair out. I mean, how many times this morning, that one reading did he say, those who have ears to hear, let them listen. For God's sake, listen. And we haven't listened. 2,000 years later, we still haven't listened. We're letting our minds go into anxiety, into fear, into anger, into warfare. So there's a time for war only because we've created a time of war. There's a time for destruction because only because we've created a time for destruction. And the news media are hounding us. I sometimes watch these old cowboy movies where they create a corral and they're trying to find wild mustangs. And the, the corral starts off with a really, really wide mouth and then it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And finally, there's a little circle with a gate in it. And they herd all these mustangs in and the mustangs are getting closer and closer and closer until finally they're in this corral and they put down the gate and they're stuck. And that's what propaganda looks like to me. That's what, when we continually allow our attention to go to anxiety and fear and unforgiveness, we're being corralled more and more into a tinier and tinier space until finally the gate is put locked down and we find ourselves with no possible way out. That's what we're been asked to do. That is what Jesus Christ is saying. For God's sake, will you open your eyes to what really is and open your ears to what really is? I want you to think about the kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? But most of us with the kingdom of heaven is you know, what the news media tells us it is, consumerism or whatever it is. So we're, we're, we're not listening and we're not looking at what Christ and the great avatars are pointing to us. John Harvey. In terms of the fellow who's talking about science and religion, to me, spiritual beliefs are, in one sense, they're a guess, but they're a guess that often seems to ground you in a new source of grace and redemption and seems often seems to ground your deepest moral and spiritual convictions. And that's why we adopt religious or spiritual beliefs is because they ground us and they, and actually, and then at the same time make it possible for us to reach much higher by that way. And they 
give a sense of an overarching meaning to the whole show, which you can't get from just material science. So to me, that's what the basis of religious belief is. Now, if people have religious beliefs that compel them to believe things about the natural observable world that go against the grain of observation like creationists then there's probably something wrong with the religious beliefs but you know that that's that's what the religious belief is about to me great 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 observation jonathan and you're absolutely right but the reality is that even the most rigorous science is based on presuppositions that cannot be proven the one of the most visions of the 20th century is kurt Gödel with his incomplete list theorem any axiomatic system of mathematics or philosophy can cannot be both consistent and complete has to be founded on at least one premise that cannot be proven. So even this itself is based on that. 